I want to go ahead and welcome you this morning to the day that the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, well, I don't know even where to start particularly. Uh, I think the 20, this today is the 6th, so 13, 20, 27. The last Sunday of the month will be the 27th. We're supposed to announce two weeks in advance so that we're going to have an annual meeting. We will have our annual meeting, which is also a board meeting, but uh, there's not really room for items on the agenda uh, unless they're urgency. Uh, in the evening, uh, service. We don't usually have an evening service. We will this time in the evening service. We will do the annual meeting. And we'll probably be getting back to an uh, evening service. If for no other reason, we have eight candidates in the ministry. I would like to be able to have them on a rotation so that they can preach regularly uh, so that uh, they get that experience. A lot of them have a lot of experience, some not so much, and everywhere in between, but just to have that opportunity and the opportunity for others to, to listen and be an encouragement to them as they, as they do that. So uh, that's uh, more than likely coming uh, soon. Also, we haven't had a board meeting now since COVID. Uh, we've had some emergency board meetings. Uh, uh, basically, that's kind of a testament to how uh, the things that we do are kind of in place, so we really haven't had to uh, tweak them. Of course, it's probably kept us from spending some money that, uh, over this period of time other than our necessary expenditure. Which brings me to this announcement. The giving last month, I very seldom talked about money, but I believe that money just uh, People, the Holy Spirit lays on people's hearts what they ought to give, and they give what the Holy Spirit tells them, so I'm not going to tell them. But our giving last month was, as on average, uh, for the same as the last few years. And, uh, and we haven't had any drop-off because of COVID, so we're still, our giving is still there, okay? So that's a sign of a reason why we don't have to tell people what to do. The Holy Spirit tells them what to do. So uh, I thank you for that. Uh, Marvin uh, had called and said that uh, he had tested positive for COVID and uh, he is in quarantine right now, as Kathy is. Um, Ray, my brother, he, uh, he tested positive for COVID. And, uh, that's one of the conferences today. So we expect some of that residual. Jacob is sick too. And Jacob is sick as well. He okay. didn't say why. Well, he's sick, so yeah. yeah. Thank you for letting us know. We we have to know. Uh, we it's, it's good to know, so we know how to pray. We will end with a pastoral prayer today uh, for these requests and others, and we'll also uh, I don't know what other announcements we have, but we have a full schedule of events that have been occurring and will continue to occur, and uh, we thank you for them. And Rigo and Krista have gone through a heroin experience, but it's really been quite. Miraculous, right? The selling of one house and moving to another. Yes, yeah, so um, we, uh, we really felt that this was a time to uh, to put up our home uh, for sale. We need to find something to replace. We didn't think about renting, but um, making sure this is the Lord. We Anybody can buy a house anytime they want to. They really have the means to, but for us, it really has to be God. So. Uh, he made a way, and the doors have been flying wide open. So we're like, not only closing dates and stuff, but crunch time is, uh, is important uh, to make it happen. So it's just been really intense, but really, uh, really blessed. So yes, thank you. It's good to see you, see you. That with us today, <coughs> Adrian and Deborah, Gardenia with us today as well, and uh, of course all of you. Uh, I was in. Uh, I went down with my, to visit my nephew of mine, Isidro, uh, Reyes, and uh, Phoenix. And that was when the housing thing was going so, they had what they call liar loans. All you had to do was make a state, a state of income loan. You could say, uh, I make $200,000 a year and they sell you a house. And Phoenix was just ground zero. There was other places like it, but places that had been bought for $63,000 a year, two years before we saw for $126,000 then. Now it'll be much more close. And so Seagro's uncle, an older gentleman, said to him, he says, we've, we've, caught, we've decided to leave the dog in the house because we can't let him out because anybody can get a mortgage anymore. So, 
And there was some dogs that got a mortgage later in the front, you know, the cats. I mean, not really, but yeah. I've seen the animal world in the realtors. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know it was there, but it's there. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We ask that you bless the music, we bless our families, bless those who are sick. And Lord, uh, anoint your words so it penetrates our hearts and our lives and makes us like you. And as you do this, we'll give you the praise. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. Good morning. Man, I remember being this big in this church as some of our young ones are now and growing up. And these walls have seen a lot of times when I've been learning about God and uh, how to be a young man in our society, and uh, a lot of you have been around and seen me go from the annoying little twerp that you might want to kick, you know, down there, to getting a little bit thicker around and growing up and the wonderful things God's done, and it's been about six and a half years now, and as many of you might know, I'm planning on getting married coming in April, so I have a, yeah, it's going to be good, I have a... That's right, you can clap. I don't like getting clapped for this right. I have a wedding invitation on the back that I put on the bulletin there. I was told it's not quite in the middle, so don't judge me for that. Uh, because I look around and I see my church family. We all have the same Father in God. I see all the people here, all my countrymen in the kingdom of God, and be wrong not to invite y'all. So it's an open invitation to everyone at the church. Come on down April 2nd, 2 o'clock. We're going to have some cake. We're going to have some sandwiches. Uh, I'm going to try to have a just long enough thing not to wear you out, and it should be good. It should be a really good time, and I want to see all you there. Are you wearing a kilt? I'm not wearing a kilt. I was told reliably it couldn't be April 1st, and I couldn't wear a kilt. Are you going to do a dance? Yeah, it was, uh, it was one of those, I wanted to, she didn't want to, we compromised, so we're not doing it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> How big is the cake? How big is the cake? I don't know, maybe two or three tiers, something like that? Big enough for Mandy to get a couple pieces. The rest of you don't care about. Senior pieces. <laughs> Cupcakes. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. One more announcement as well. Um, talk to Pastor Angus about you know we've had an overflow of goodies out here, and uh, I know a lot of people have uh, been donating and stuff. So uh, I know spring cleaning is coming. Um, I think I'm going to encourage you to start early. We are tentatively wanting to have a yard sale here uh, the end of this month, February 26th, in the gym. So Friday night we come, the 25th will set up. Whatever you think could sell for, for a couple of dimes, a dollar or two bucks, uh, bring it on by and we're gonna set it all up and um, have a big yard sale and post it on Facebook and just let the community know, come and shop and we'll end up giving a lot of it away as well. You know, you see people in need, we're not gonna charge them 25 cents. Yeah, so if you got your stuff, bring it on by. Amen? Okay. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 says this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worry can add a single hour to his or her life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, that not even Solomon, all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? And what shall we drink? And what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble 
of its own. Our today's uh, hymn is found in your hymnal, um, 103, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Will you join us, please?
2.6 says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Amen. In order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. Please join us in our hymn, Amazing Grace, number 85. Yeah. 
This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Pity the man who has no friends. Pity the woman who has no friends. He had four that carried his litter, his bed, and there were others that came with him. But I like to look at the scripture sometimes, the parts that aren't written down, and kind of figure out what happened there. So I want you to know it's just me figuring, but some, it doesn't take away from the scripture. The scripture says that his friends brought him to Jesus. They went up on the roof, <laughs> took up some of the roof, and lowered him. I mean, I get this picture that these houses weren't that big. They're probably dropping dirt into the stew and stuff. I mean, I, I don't know if they're cooking, Steve, or what, but there's some debris coming down. You can't just pull up the roof without something coming down. I know that. You can't dig a hole without more dirt falling in, right? I mean, eventually you get the dirt out, but as you're digging, dirt falls in behind you. Sometimes it seems like more falls in than you're taking out. So this couldn't have been done without some sediment coming into the house, dust, and, you know, whatever. But let's just picture this guy a few, a little bit before this, and his wife looks out the door, I'm assuming he was married, most everybody was back then, he, he looks out the door, or somebody in his family looks out the door, he didn't live, there were very few permits, they were there out in the desert, in the caves, they weren't in the town, by the very definition of a hermit. So, I'm, so there's somebody here, he says, well who is it? So well it just looks like a whole bunch of guys here you know. What are they here for? Well, I don't know. They just showed up for no reason. He said, well, I was kind of at the well the other day and told a friend of mine that my husband really couldn't get up out of his bed and he was paralyzed. Why did you do that? Well, because you are paralyzed and you are in your bed. You know, I mean, this, this argument could have went sideways really easy. Because you, 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 this is the way you've been. And I can just imagine the whole group on the way. Now, if it wasn't this man saying this, there was somebody there was saying this. And if they hadn't said it on the way, when they got closer and saw that the whole house was full and you couldn't even get in the yard gone because everybody was standing knee-deep and there was no way to get in, I'm sure there were a few people that brought up some objections. Are you one of those people that brings up objections every once in a while? I am. Are you one of those persons who listens to objections every once in a while? I am. Uh, I'm sure there were some people saying, how are we even going to get through the crowd? And what's, what's your plan anyway? Oh, we're going to go up on the roof. Well, how are you going to get up on the roof? Nobody brought a ladder. Did you bring a ladder? No. There's ladders here. We'll, we'll borrow one. We'll borrow, we're going to go up on the roof. And what are you going to do when you get up on the roof? We're going to tear up the roof. And we're going to bring the sick man up on the roof. He's paralyzed. We're going to get him up there somehow. Pull these ropes, I don't know. We're going to get him up there, stand him on somebody's shoulder, and pitch him under the roof, and then drag him up the rest of the way. That's not going to work. It ain't going to work, Don, <laughs> right? I'm out in Montana one time, and I was, like, I was heading the crew, I used to do minor home repair, and the water had taken out one bedroom of this whole house. Because they have floods out there a lot. And we're there to fix it, which means you have to hang new. Joys, uh, you got a foundation, you got to have some concrete or some pure block, something to hold it, make it stay. And I was with a guy, and he was that way. It didn't matter what you, what happened. He was from Rhode Island. I won't mention Joe was his first name. I won't mention the rest of his name. Anyway, in case he's listening today, but he'll recognize himself anyway. Because <laughs> we had this conversation often. He says we can't do it. Like we can't fix one room in a house that people built 80 years ago, a two-story farmhouse they built, and we can't fix one room. It's still there. The only thing has gone is the floor. It can't be fixed. You just throw a match in there, I guess, and burn it down and start over. I said, and this is the type of thinking you'll run into often, though. And sometimes, hopefully it isn't us, but sometimes it is. We're trying to help people understand that they really probably can't do what they think they can do. Forgetting that if God asked the shepherd boy to kill the giant, God would help him kill the giant. He couldn't kill the giant, but with God he could. So on the way, I'm sure there was a lot of 
commotion. There was even people saying, why do you think you could push your way through? We've been standing here, we, we were here last night camping out for this occurrence. But they did. They pushed through. They pushed through all the objections, maybe even brought up with the sick man himself. Because if he was like a lot of us, he probably didn't want any. He probably did die. He probably did really want help. He didn't want to say he wanted help. Because maybe somebody else is sicker than he is. Who knows? But regardless of all the people that kind of raised objections and said, that's the most half witted thing I've ever seen. I've seen some half-witted things in my life with people getting up on a roof with a sick person, a paralyzed man, to cut a hole in the roof and drop him in is right up there at the top. Some of these objections were certainly raised. The homeowner might even erase some. Some might have said, oh, now you've got me, Don. You've got me over here to tear up this roof, and the homeowner's going to sue me. And I'm going to end up paying for it. You, you, you can fill in the blanks. But they did it. Because he had friends. He had friends that were concerned. We know, we don't have to read anything into this. They were concerned enough about him to take extraordinary steps. Just on the off chance that he could walk again. He could get up. And Jesus, Jesus must have been just... Well, nothing ever amazes Jesus, really, but I'm sure he thought it was pretty neat that some people had enough faith that they would go to this, this degree of effort for their friend. And he said to his friend, you know, because of all this, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. Pity the man or woman who has no friend, no helper. Because if he or she falls, who is going to help them up? Who is going to help them up? What do friends do? They direct people to God. They take people to God if they can. They lead people to God. What people do once they get in the presence of God is a personal thing that they have full control over, but the friend at least tells them about it. God. Paul says, always be prepared to give a defense of the hope that you have in you. In other words, I was thinking about that this morning when I was reading Dear Abby or whatever, and some people went over and thoroughly alienated, wasn't necessarily a Christian, but he thoroughly alienated this woman by insisting on helping her when she didn't want any help. Because they had a right to do this and they wanted to, you know. But we're not that people. We all believe in evangelism, don't we? We all believe that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, don't we? But we also believe that we have to be given an opportunity to give, Paul says, a defense for the hope that lies within you. At that point, you can't lead them to God, to, to Christ. What you can do is it's when they come to you at that point and they say, I know, how, I know from your testimony how your life was, and now it's this way. How did that happen? Did you go to a self-help program or did you take a pill? Or what did you do? And you say, I didn't do anything except kneel at the foot of Jesus and cast myself on the mercy of his holy, uh, holy cord, on the mercy of God, and ask him to help me, and he did. They said, well, that's plumb stupid. Well, but you told them now, haven't you? You shared that. That's what you're to do. Friends lead people or direct people to the to God. If you look at this story, you'll see that. He doesn't tell us whether he wanted to go or whether he didn't want to go. It didn't really matter. They picked him up on his... On his uh, I probably would have had a few things to say. Oh, gosh, you guys, this is just too much. But they didn't care what I said or what he said. They just took him. And the Lord healed him. Friends, speak truth to you. When we say, I am your parent, I do this often. I tell that kid, I am your parent. I'm not your friend. Like they're mutually exclusive. I feel like they are mutually exclusive. 
I am not your friend, I'm your parent. But what we're really referring to at that point is what we would call a false friend. A true friend is one who, a true friend is one who helps you, doesn't harm you. A true friend will keep you from being harmed. A true friend will direct you to what is helpful for you and not what isn't. In 1 Corinthians 6.12 it says, I have the right to do anything. You say, but not everything is beneficial. He says, I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 and 24 says, I have the right. Paul's a little later in the same chapter is going on. Again, he says, I have the right to do anything. And he says, you say, but not, he said, I have the right to do anything. You say, but not everything is beneficial, Paul says. I have the right to do anything. That's true. But not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So a true friend seeks the good of others, doesn't it? Doesn't that person? A true friend seeks the good of others. You know, if your friends do not seek your own good, they're not friends. They're the kind of friends a parent refers to. He says, I'm not that kind of friend. I'm your parent. I seek your good. I seek what's best for you. If your friends do not, they are not friends. They're just, and I've said fill in the blank, just drinking buddies or uh, whatever kind of buddies they might be. That's what they are. They're not true friends. They don't have your best interests at heart. Paul says, I will, even though I could drink and I don't think I'll go to hell if I have a glass of wine, he says, I would refrain from doing so if it caused my brother to stumble. What does it say in the scripture about the little ones? It says, you might as well put a millstone around your neck and throw yourselves into a pond or the sea as to cause one of these to stumble. A true friend will not lead their friend into stumbling or falling away from what's best for them. They will not do that. Friends are sent by God to speak, to speak truth to you. When we were growing up, we grew up on four contiguous properties that are about two-thirds of a square mile, two-thirds by two-thirds, irregular shape. But the one to the east of us was my uh, mom's cousin, who we call him Aunt, and Uncle Jane and Uncle Sam. And Jane would spank us. We didn't get spanked too often, Myra. My mom would spank her kids. We, they had kind of a treaty, my mom and my aunt that if we were doing wrong and the other parent was gone and not able to discipline their children, that one would. And you know, we didn't really resent it anymore. We resented our own mother spanking us because we knew that she loved us and she cared about us. And if she spanked us, it might not have... It wasn't always true when she said, this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me, but we knew it was for our own good. That eventually it would be for our benefit and we could accept that my mom would not tolerate anybody disciplining us if she thought they didn't that person didn't like us not didn't like what we were doing but didn't like us that person didn't have that right a friend has that right to speak truth to you and if the friend can't speak truth to you, then you're not allowing them to be a friend. You're saying, you can only be my friend if you agree with me. But a friend has the right to speak to you because it's really God uses who to speak to us? Friends. Brothers and sisters. Other people. Sometimes, right? God speaks to us through other people. So they obviously have a right and they're taking a risk if God says, I want you to speak. Like Nathan, when he spoke to David, he comes and says, uh, gives a description of a person who did a horrible thing. And David says, tell me who this is so I can go punish him. And he says, uh, you're that guy, David. That, that, that's you. Friends 
are sent by God or they're around us so that they can speak truth to us. And friends have to have that right or privilege to speak truth to you or they're really not friends because they really do care for you and they're seeking your own good. If your friends do not, as I said, they're not friends. They're just buddies. And a buddy is not somebody that's going to really look out for your best interest. In fact, they're going to encourage you to go south so they can go south with you. In Numbers 22, verse 22, starting with verse 22, but God was very angry when he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him, Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat it to get it back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it, so he beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. No room. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and it said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me three times. If it had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared it or the donkey. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now if you are displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with them in. Don't go back. Go with them. But speak only what I tell you. I include this story because it shows that the angel of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, speaks to us through different ways. And because Barb's always saying that animals are probably more intelligent than, than humans. And this donkey certainly was. It cost him three beatings, but he was smarter than the guy who was writing him. If God can speak through the Holy Spirit using a donkey, He can use you. You see, we can look at the Scripture and know some things that are true. All things are true in the Scripture, but we can take from that Scripture that friends will speak truth to you. The Holy Spirit was sent to guide us into what? Some truth? Or all truth? Amen. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. A true friend will admonish you, will help you, even if you don't know you need help. A true friend will help you not to stumble and not to fall. It will not be a part to that. And the Holy Spirit will speak to you through a multiple amount of ways. In our Articles of Faith, I was looking at it a little earlier, uh, we have uh, on sin. Original and Personal, Article 5. And it would be of no value except it's followed by about 25 scriptures you can read if you want. It has the scriptures that it, that it touches on. that apart from the Holy Spirit, we have no spiritual life, and we are inclined to evil. And that continually, without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we are inclined to evil. 
That was not God's intent for us. That was our choice. And it's been a choice that has been made over and over and over again. Clear back into the garden, and then it was followed by the 14th chapter, the 14th verse of the third chapter of Genesis, where God speaks to Satan and tells him the seed of the woman. And it's a prophecy, the first prophecy. So the seed of the woman will crush your head. 1 John 3, 8 says, the reason, not the reasons, the reason the Son of God appeared. The reason the Son of God appeared. Not me saying it, not you saying it. The scripture says, 1 John 3, 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. What was that work? It was to mar God's creation. To make it less than, or to appear to be less than. To make us feel as if we can't be happy. We can't have a meaningful life. We can't do this. We can't do that. When we say, I am your parent, not your friend, we're not saying that friends aren't important. We're saying that a friend will not steer you away from God. A friend will not stir you away from God. Anybody that will do that, Anybody who will help you to do that is not your friend. And anybody you help to do that, you're not being a friend to them. The Holy Spirit is a lot like, have you ever seen water? Water runs downhill, doesn't it? It seeks its level. That's how you can make a level, water level. It, 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 it runs downhill. Be a, be a plumber. Plumbers spend most of their time trying to figure out how to keep water inside of something. Water will run downhill. Water doesn't run uphill. Water can only run uphill if it runs downhill further and hits something like a, that's not permeable, that sucks up the water, and it can shoot up higher. Under pressure, like a geyser, it can, it can rise up, but without pressure, it is always running downhill. Without the Holy Spirit in your and my life, the manual says, and the accompanying scriptures, say that we are inclined to sin. That's our natural level. With the Holy Spirit, we are not. With the pressure of the Holy Spirit, water can only go uphill with a pump or a gravity feed. We can only reclaim our image with the Holy Spirit, the pressure of the Holy Spirit, to expel the sinful nature. We, on our own, run and seek our own level. We need the Holy Spirit's pressure to redirect our path to God's path. Paul says again that all things are lawful, but few are expedient. All things are lawful, but few are expedient. You know, I had a I had been thinking about a lot of things lately. I don't want to go too far too too far aside, but I want you to really understand that a, a person without a friend, a godly friend, is in danger. If you're not being a godly friend to somebody, you're putting them in danger. And a true friend does not put their friends in danger. The Holy Spirit can speak to you directly. The Holy Spirit can speak to you through a friend. The Holy Spirit can also, I'm just jumping a little bit ahead, the Holy Spirit can also speak to you through an enemy. God uses enemies to speak to you as well. That's what's been lost in our country right now, maybe the world, maybe it always has been happening. There's a, a law to declassify fentanyl as a class, to take it off of the class A list, which is the highest negative list you can be on as a drug. On February 18th, it'll expire, it'll, it'll fall to like, it's okay to shoplift $1,000, 
I think, it will fall to that level. It will no longer be a crime. The largest killer of people in this country between the ages of 18 and I believe it's 45, it could be 49, but I believe it's 45. It doesn't matter. It's the largest killer of fentanyl. Did you realize that the tolerance on drugs has to be quite wide? Because we don't all weigh the same. We don't all have the same metabolism, even if we did weigh all the same, right? So you can't just, if you take three aspirins, drop dead. I don't know what the toxic level of aspirin is, but probably if you even took a whole bottle, they could take you to the doctor and pump your stomach or make you throw up some of it, you know, whatever. And you would live. It can't be that close, because if it was, people would be dying all the time. They took two aspirin, they took two later, and they dropped dead. It can't be. Most medicines have to have a wide latitude. Now, I, I, I don't mean the doctor, the pastor says, uh, all these medicines have a wide latitude. The doctor told me two, I'm going to take six. Now, that's what I'm saying. What I'm saying, if you take six, you're probably not going to die. But if you get one fentanyl pill, it looks just like, or Oxycontin, it looks just like the ones that are made by the pharmaceutical companies. People buy pill presses on Amazon and other places to press them. And if it has like four grains of salt, that's too many. You will die. There's a lot of people, and I know that you're saying, well, the parents are just saying their kids probably weren't addicts. Uh, I think a lot of some of the people with fentanyl overdoses were addicts. I think a lot of them were just kids that take a pill. Kids do that sometimes. I don't know why. They take a pill to see if they'll keep. Can if I take this speed, can I stay up? Uh, pill? Can I really study and get my? And you can stay up all night, but you still don't remember anything on the test. But they don't die. One pill. It's the wrong one. You're dead. And fentanyl kills more people than all than any other single cause of death for that age group. It's a number one killer. Not COVID, not cancer, not heart, not suicide, not blah blah blah. No. Fentanyl. And we have a bill that was introduced to extend it. Now, when I get done saying this, let me let me fix this, okay? Don't don't get don't 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 get all in an uproar or, or don't clap. One party, which happens to be the Democratic Party, voted 218. They have 218 members, and the Republicans have 200. Anyway, they have a majority in the House voted to kill the bill. Not one opposed it. Now you have to ask yourself, why would anybody? vote to make a drug that is already so lethal that it's the number one killer of people between those age groups more legal with less penalty. Hmm. Why would anybody do that? Well, it's the same reason that the other side of the aisle, if uh, tomorrow somebody advanced something that was to make a very big help to everybody, would automatically be opposed by the, the other side. It's very rare that they vote against each other's bills. Even if they said they could grow hair on a billboard ball, somebody would vote against it. Almost in lockstep. Because they have drank the Kool-Aid, and the Kool-Aid says is your enemies can never help you. Well, you're ignoring a third of the cognitive factor that the Lord uses through the Holy Spirit to help people. It says every good and perfect gift comes down from our Father above. So your enemy can have a good and perfect gift from God and still not acknowledge God's presence. Your enemy could actually invent the cure for childhood leukemia and your child has leukemia. Well, I ain't taking that because he's a Buddhist. Didn't ask you to convert to Buddhism. Just asked you to take a pill that somebody was a Buddhist invented. He might become a Christian later. When you couch everything in this enemy terminology, then you no longer can hear the Holy Spirit through half of the people in this country cannot receive anything from the other half. And there's, a, there's more to the argument than that. I understand that. And I'd be the first to sit down and talk to you about it. What I'm talking about, it gets to the area of craziness. When you no longer can talk about sensible things, in a sensible way. Because it comes from that person. To me, prior to my being saved, that person was my mother-in-law. I said
said, I can't accept from her hand. She was a Christian. I don't want her to say, I told you so. So I, but that night when I was called, I finally came and I answered the call. There was a, I want to just jump ahead. There was an article in the paper, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's about this young girl who was uh, Miss USA, 30 years old, and she took her life. She had TV contracts, she had everything. This is the Saturday's paper you read. And there was no science. Or at least nobody knew of a sign. And what the article is, is it was basically, it's from a secular standpoint, if people have it all, how come they take their life? Well, what if your identity is in Christ? What if your identity is in the Holy Spirit? What if your identity is in Christ and you're not a Christian? Then where's your identity? that the enemy can't attack. Where is your identity? Well, I'm not saying we're going to go there because I don't think we're going to go there. Our society isn't ready to accept what works. It isn't ready to accept what works. But friends can speak to you. Enemies can sometimes speak truth to you. And the Holy Spirit can use, directly speak to you and we need all of those influences to continue on the path that God has for us. We've got to get to the place as a church where this is why I'll end, because I don't want to judge the world. That's up to somebody else. If the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, and churches are eliminating the Holy Spirit, where is truth going to come from, God? If churches are eliminating, well, they can't eliminate, but they're trying to eliminate the influence of the Holy Spirit, where does truth come from? We need the Holy Spirit. We're going to, uh, I was asked Rita to sing, we're going to sing a hymn to close the day, it's a mighty fortress is our God. A mighty fortress is our God. You know what? <clears throat> I didn't look it up. Did you? Page 30. Page 30. I was going to say it's one of those, uh, one in the beginning, you know, like holy, 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 and all of those. Page 30. This is speaking about power of the Holy Spirit. It was written uh, close to 500 years ago.
Father, we look to you today, uh, those who have been listening and uh, hearing it and also uh, on our stream. We look uh, surely to you, Mike and, and Lindsay and uh, Randy and Heather, and uh, Lord, those who are sick and away from us today, to bring healing to all of them. We give you the praise as you do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. 